Uh, thanks again for joining. Uh, we're really excited to talk about how you can build your own LLM um, on Ludwig and Predibase. Before we get started, just some real brief logistics. Um, all the lines are muted, as I mentioned earlier. If you have questions, we do want this to be interactive. So please submit your questions in the chat bar on the right over there. We will get to them at the end during the live Q&A. Uh, today's session is recorded and will be shared afterwards. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Predibase, you can go to our website and request a demo or, or a, a trial. And then also if you're interested in learning more about Ludwig, the open source project, um, you can visit ludwig.ai. We have some great polling questions there to kind of get a sense of, uh, you know, what everyone is working on and if you take a minute to fill those out. And with that, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today, Travis Adair. He's the CTO and co-founder of Predibase, also the creator and maintainer of Horvod, um, was an engineering leader at, at Uber prior to Predibase, and we'll be um, talking about some of the cool things we're doing here. And joining him is also a founding engineer, ML engineer at Predibase, Arnav Garg who also has a lot of experience in the industry and uh, we'll talk about the great and exciting things they're building around large language models and, and share our best practices. So with that, I'll hand it over to Travis. All right, thanks, Michael. All right, just gonna share my screen real quick. Okay. All right, thanks everyone for coming out today. Um, as Michael mentioned, um, I'm Travis Adair, uh, CTO of Predibase. Uh, previously uh, was a, uh, a tech lead and manager for Uber's uh, Michelangelo machine learning platform. Uh, there I led, a, led the uh, deep learning infrastructure team focused on uh, scaling out the training of deep uh, language or <laughs> deep learning models of which large language models are uh, a type of deep learning technology. So definitely uh, very relevant to today's discussion, I think. Um, and with me here is, uh, is Arnav from our team, if you'd like to uh, say a few things about yourself. Thanks, Travis. So I'm Arnav, um, been a Predibase for about a year, and I work um, you know, as an ML engineer on distributed training, scaling, hyperopt, um, and lately large language models, which are all the rage. Um, prior, being, prior to being at Predibase, um, I was actually a machine learning engineer at Atlassian, where I was training a lot of uh, recommendation systems for different, you know, smart features and Atlassian's products like Confluence and Trello. Awesome. And today, what we're going to do is uh, give you a brief overview of um, how we think about what it means to build an LLM using um, the open source technologies that we, we that came out of the uh, Uber AI lab that uh, myself and my co-founder Piero worked at. Um, which is the Ludwig open source framework. And we'll talk a little bit about some features we've uh, added and have been adding that uh, make it possible to build an LM. And then also how to use those in a managed platform, which is Predibase, which is what our, our company is building. So to kind of walk you through the, the topics here. So first we're gonna start by talking about why you would want to choose open LLMs and an open platform like Predibase over closed APIs and closed platforms. Um, what exactly we mean by building an LLM and how you can think about that in different ways, depending on your use case and kind of where you're at with your own um, large language model journey. Uh, how to choose the right LLM customization for your tasks. It turns out there are lots of different things you've probably heard in the space about ways you can customize LLMs. And so we'll talk a little bit about how you can think about like which of these techniques is most relevant for you. Then we'll give you a brief intro to fine tuning both with Ludwig and with Predibase, as well as a little conceptual overview of some of the features of the product and uh, the open source tools. And then our novel will give you a live demo showing how you can put all this together uh, in Predibase um, using our managed uh, managed platform. Um, now, you know, large language model is a, is a term that's certainly become very popular recently. Um, I think that in particular, we're all familiar with LLMs uh, through the product ChatGPT, if nothing else, uh, where you know this very prominent example of um, a, a powerful large language model that's backing this very nice like chat user experience. And so, you know, that's fundamentally what we're talking about today is how you can, you know, enable capabilities like this on your own data uh, with your own models in your own environment. Um, but crucially, I think that, you know, while it's very cool that chatbots uh, like ChatGPT can, you know, tell knock-knock jokes, one of the things we like to emphasize with Predibase is that that kind of general intelligence capability isn't usually what you're looking for 
uh, when you're building a uh, building an, a large language model for the enterprise or for your organization, you're typically looking for a more specialized solution to a particular problem like customer service, uh, triage or, or, or assistance or, you know, doing some sort of generation of, uh, of copy or ad copy or something like that for an ad campaign. You're not usually looking for like a general purpose system. And so we say that closed source LLMs are a great start, but there are some fundamental limitations that um, folks run into when they start to think about productionization. So these models are hosted by a third party. So there's a data privacy concern that, you know, it's one of the first things that folks encounter uh, when they try to do customization, for example, fine tuning, like we'll talk about, uh, the tools are often rather limited. Um, there's limited control over, you know, the underlying architecture or the underlying hyperparameters that you can select. There's the possibility for vendor lock-in as you build more and more layers of uh, bespoke infrastructure on top of these tools. And so if, you know, you ever want to change uh, in the future, you know, it becomes a lot harder. For example, pricing or things like that become prohibitive. Um, opaque data sources and model implementations. So you don't really know what went into these systems. And so it's hard for you to reason about whether or not they fit your own requirements or business needs or regulatory concerns. Um, the APIs are often, you know, hosted externally, so they're slower than they would be if they were hosted in your VPC. They're also rate limited in most cases, um, and so it's much harder to set like strong service level agreements over them. And when you scale them out, they tend to be actually quite expensive. So, you know, three cents a query may not sound like a lot, but that adds up very quickly when you're doing thousands of queries per second in like a production system, right? So open source LMs are a promising alternative. And in particular, um, I, I think that this is definitely bearing out as we see the rapid pace at which um, open source models are catching up to some of the big commercial uh, models like ChatGPT and Bard from Google. So if you look at you know, where we start on the left, like uh, Meta released uh, Llama 13 billion, not even the largest of their open source models. And already out of the gate, it was, was pretty competitive with some of the closed source models. And then within a matter of just a few weeks, we had the release of Alpaca 13 billion, which we'll be talking more about today during the demo portion. And then Vicuna 13 billion came, you know, just a week after that. And suddenly we're very close to seeing parity with some of these commercial models. And, you know, we're only at the beginning of this journey. So the nice thing about these open source LMs uh, beyond performance is that they can be hosted in your own environment, ensuring data privacy. They're fully customizable through fine tuning and other techniques. And the models can be will be continuously improved by the open source community over time uh, to solve more specialized tasks. So you know you can kind of do a bit of a shopping around for different open source models depending on your task and your data to figure out which one works best for you. And these will you know continue to just explode in terms of the number and variety of different open source models. And the cost is ultimately determined by your compute and how efficient um, you know that compute is managed, not by token usage. So for example, if you want to run on premise or something like that in your own data centers, you know, obviously that will be a lot cheaper than, you know, trying to run it in a more hosted way using uh, third parties. But uh, all that said, building and hosting open source LMs is still a challenge. Uh, training and operationalizing them requires highly specialized infrastructure in most cases. So the first thing you run into is that just hosting an LLM for low latency uh, serving like zero shot inference can be a tricky thing to get right. Um, you know, you, the initial implementation might actually be quite slow um, or might be very expensive. And so you, you know, need to do, do a lot of work to optimize that. Um, and then you might want to layer on document retrieval capabilities for doing, you know, in context learning, as we say, or few shot inference, which requires setting up more infrastructure. If you want to fine tune it, you need to figure out how to do distributed training over large data sets. Um, so that can be a, its own set of challenges. And then you know, there's this whole other kind of, you know, abyss of, of pre-training from scratch on terabytes of unstructured data or doing reinforcement learning through human feedback, which, you know, require highly, highly customized uh, tech stacks as well. So how exactly do you build an LLM when all said and done then? And the answer there is machine learning, which is something that, you know, we've been doing for a long time. As I mentioned, like we've been doing, um, training deep learning models as a team for, for many years now, going back to our time at Uber. Um, and really the way that I think about uh, fine tuning uh, or the way that I think about building LLMs is that you really break the problem down into different stages of the LLM journey. So 
the first thing that you'll typically do is the pre-training step, um, which is where you take just an unlabeled corpus of images, or not images, sorry, unlabeled corpus of data, um, and you want to basically uh, train a model that will complete sentences uh, for you. So basically try to predict what comes after given what came before. So for example, you know, you say the quick brown fox and the model should learn that it wants to say something like jumped over the lazy dog. Um, from there, uh, after doing pre-training comes the fine tuning step, which is the part that we'll be spending the most time of the talk talking about today. And this is where you have a labeled data set and you want to then uh, take your pre-trained model and get it to uh, output something that's more task specific or, or more uh, particular to your use case, right? So instead of just doing uh, next word completion, you might have uh, an instruction that you wanna give it, like tell me what the capital of California is and the model should be able to respond with an answer like Sacramento. So in this case, it's not just thinking about, you know, what's the next uh, logical word, like if this were just a free formed um, uh, sentence, but rather, you know, actually given an input, what is the output? So much more functional, much more supervised learning type of framing of the problem. And then the last step that uh, is a refinement step that happens in some cases, particularly for chatbots, uh, less commonly used in other cases, at the moment is this reinforcement learning through human feedback step. And this is where um, you incorporate human biases or human subjective preferences into the model. So for example, you know, you might want to uh, add some restrictions on the model that it shouldn't uh, say certain things, even though it knows how to say certain things or should say things in a certain way in order to be uh, compliant to, you know, the human preference. So for example, you know, for uh, a lot of these commercially deployed large language models, if a user wanted to ask it to say something offensive, the language model should learn to have a nice, polite response saying, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Um, and that's typically something, the phrasing of which would be refined through a process like reinforcement learning through human feedback. And so because this is ultimately an ML process all the way down, like through pre-training, fine-tuning, reinforcement learning, um, I want to briefly talk about the Ludwig framework and our experience building ML applications and how this worked, at, uh, how we did this at Uber. So, you know, one problem that we quickly ran into when we were working on the Uber AI team was that uh, very frequently you would have a use case come in, like automating custom, uh, customer support, and you'd have to write thousands of lines of TensorFlow that would take months to build and deploy. A second problem where you have hundreds of lines of PyTorch and months to deploy for fraud, fraud prevention. And then Uber Eats personalization, which similarly has thousands of lines of code and takes months and months to deploy. And fundamentally, we uh, very quickly realized that there was a lot of inefficiency here, a lot of reinventing the wheel, particularly as model architectures have become more standard and data infrastructure has become more standard. And so uh, what um, our co-founding team did was put together this uh, framework called Ludwig, um, which aims to make AI and now LLMs easy through this declarative interface. So the nice thing about um, what Ludwig provides is it gives you this very easy starting point. So for example, you have a specification for an LM task, which is, you know, my model name is llama 7 billion. It takes a sentence as input and it outputs a, a category like the user's intent. And this can be deployed, you know, just in a matter of, of you know, hours or days at worst, as opposed to taking months, right? And it gives you a lot of control. So if you want to do uh, fine tuning and specify a specific optimizer, it's very easy to specify that through uh, this uh, trainer section that you see here. And then we also provide advanced functionality as well. Like if you want to do a hyperparameter sweep over multiple different large language models, you know that's something that's very easy to do as well through the same declarative interface. And so what this ultimately buys you is that because um, you know, the infrastructure is very complex, but at the end of the day, you know, we're using very standard techniques to uh, train these models and, and deploy these models. You know, this gives you a very um, uh, simple entry point into being able to do this kind of customization that doesn't require you to go and download a bunch of Python Jupyter notebooks and figure out how to spin up your own infrastructure to do this training. You know, you just say, this is what I want my LLM to do. Like this is what I wanted to, to take as input. This is what I wanted to take as output. And then from there, Ludwig and Predibase does all the hard work of figuring out how to make that possible. And so, you know, Ludwig is the open source core of the product um, and our what our team works on, uh, this low code interface that uh, allows you to avoid reinventing the wheel and puts no limits on what you can control. 
that's all part of the Linux Foundation fully open source. Um, you can go and download the code and contribute yourself if you'd like. And then what Predibase layers on top is a fully managed uh, enterprise platform that allows you to connect uh, to your data and you know, S3 or Snowflake or Databricks, et cetera, and then provides a model repository so you can track and refine different um, you know, fine-tuned LLMs and things like that or other types of models. And then provides a really smooth process to deploy those models once you're happy with them to production so you can query them the same way you would query a model like ChatGPT through a very simple and intuitive interface. And all of this is fully managed and scalable infrastructure uh, built on top of open source tools um, uh, using the Predibase uh, infrastructure layer on top. So with Predibase, it's very easy to get started. Um, you can deploy any large language model using just a couple of commands. You can say pbase deploy any large language model that's hosted in uh, the Hugging Face Hub or internally on, on Predibase itself. And then you can just start querying uh, that you can query it through a Python SDK through the command line as shown here or through the web UI as Arnav will show you later. But now there's this question of, okay, so I deployed my LLM, now what? And this is, I think, the, the most important thing I want to uh, kind of emphasize is that there are lots and lots of different things that you might want to do at this point, right? So the first question you might ask is, you know, do I have a task or not? I think a lot of people get started with LLMs not really having a specific task or goal in mind. And so they might go down this right path here where we'll say, you know, do you have a data set? If not, what you're doing is essentially at this point what we call zero-shot learning or zero-shot inference. You're just prompting the model to do something like say, what's the sentiment of this task, of this uh, text? And then it's supposed to give you an answer. If you do have data, then the next question you ask is, you know, does the context of this data fit inside a single prompt to the model? Um, if no, then probably you'll want to do some sort of pre-training step to you know, make the model uh, better predict um, on your type of on your data set um, as opposed to just whatever it uh, you know would have learned from scouring Wikipedia and the public internet. But if your context does fit inside a single prompt to the model, commonly what you do is what we call indexing, where you create an embedding store over your data and then do information retrieval to find the most relevant chunks of data from your data set to answer the question, insert that in the prompt, and then the model will use that to, to make its prediction. So these are all the things that you might do if you don't have um, a specific task in mind. And these were, in fact, things that we uh, showed in our last webinar for folks who were there. Um, or if not, you know, please feel free to go back and check that out. Uh, these are also features we added to Ludwig and v0.8. Um, which is our new release coming out this month. Um, and so, you know, that's like one potential path that you might take. The second path is if you do have a task in mind, and then from there, the question you would ask is, you know, is this a predictive task? Like I want to predict um, a category, I want to predict uh, a number or something like that. Or is this a generative task? Like I want to generate new text or I want to generate JSON documents or something like that. For predictive tasks, the first question is, do you have labels or not? If no, you would do zero shot learning. If yes, if you have hundreds of labels, you might do few shot learning where you say, here are a few examples of what I want you to predict. Now go and predict the, on this new input. If you have, you know, maybe thousands of, uh, if you don't have thousands of examples, but you do have hundreds, then you might uh, do what we call this indexing step, very similar to what we did for um, the case where you don't have a task, but in this case, you're uh, basically doing the few shot learning with the context being derived from the embedding store. And then finally, if you do have thousands or tens of thousands of examples, this is where you might get into what we call fine tuning, in which case um, you have a few different options available to you. You can either fine tune the whole model, which is what we call you know, full fine tuning, or you can fine tune just a classification uh, portion of the model or you know, the task specific uh, few layers at the end of the model. Uh, which is sometimes called linear probing. We also call it you know, freezing the, the LLM encoder and then training the classification decoder. And this is something that we've had in, in Ludwig since um, for a while, in, in particular in v0.7. And we'll talk a little bit about when you would want to use this approach. But I want to compare that to what happens in the generative case, which is you know, you're trying to generate new text or something like that. Then the question really becomes, you know, how do you want to score these outputs? Is it subjective based on human preferences, in which case you would use reinforcement learning through human feedback? 
or is it objective, meaning that there's like a right or wrong answer um, that we can give through training data, then you would want to use what we call instruction fine tuning. And so in today's talk, we're going to be talking specifically about instruction fine tuning in the demo. And we'll also talk a little bit about these other two types of fine tuning. And uh, hopefully we'll have a follow up webinar in the future to talk, tell you about reinforcement learning through human feedback. So revisiting our slide before about pre training, fine tuning, reinforcement learning through human feedback. One of the big reasons to focus on fine tuning is that it's a very cost effective option. So oftentimes the pre training step, people talk about spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on this in some cases, uh, whereas fine tuning, oftentimes it can be very cheap um, if your model is very small and your data is very small. And, you know, even in the kind of upper case, you know, you might spend you know, thousands of dollars, like order of single digit thousands on a very large data set of a very large model. Um, but that's still very much like orders of magnitude away from uh, pre-training. And RLHF, um, you could say it kind of fits somewhere in the middle. I think part of the cost also comes from the cost of human labelers. Um, but uh, that's, again, something we'll defer to uh, another time to talk more about. And so what is fine tuning really at the end of the day, then, if that's what we're going to focus on? So fine tuning is really updating the model weights to tailor its responses for your use case. So in this case, we have some data, the input is a message, the output is some JSON, and that goes through the LLM um, when applied with this Ludwig configuration of saying, I wanna fine tune it, and here's my optimizer, and here's how many epochs I wanna train for. And the output is going to be a model that basically takes this and, and tries to predict this as opposed to whatever it was trained to do before. So you're kind of moving the direction of the model's predictions more towards uh, the structured output, the, the, the format of the output that you provide in the training data set. And the benefits of doing this is obviously better performance on your task, hopefully, um, instead of just the general intelligence of the pre-trained large language model. And also being able to train smaller but equally performant LLMs to achieve lower latency at lower costs. So you can fine tune a smaller LLM instead of relying on a big massive LLM with zero shot or few shot learning. And you can get much lower latency and much higher uh, in, also better performance in a lot of cases because the model is specialized to doing only your task. So in terms of the, what fine tuning means um, for you, one other thing I want to point out, kind of going back to that generative versus predictive thing, is that oftentimes um, there's a, a question about like, what's the most correct or most cost effective way to do the fine tuning? Um, one thing I want to point out is that in a lot of cases, you don't actually need to do this full fine tuning of the large language model, where you take the pre-trained um, large language model that outputs some embeddings and you're um, training or fine tuning also the part that generates text at the end. Um, oftentimes what you're really trying to do is say predict sentiment or predict a score or something like that, in which case you don't really want to generate text. You want to generate a number or uh, one of a handful of different um, categories, right? And in those cases, um, this approach here actually makes a lot more sense where you basically get rid of the part that generates text and you just take the embeddings from the model and then train a specialized classification model, which is just a few linear layers uh, um, built on top and train that. Um, and that ends up being a lot more performance, a lot more cost effective in practice. And, you know, to really drive down the cost, you can even go one step further and hold the entire pre-trained encoder portion frozen so you don't adjust the weights at all and you only adjust the classification decoder at the end and this can give you very dramatic uh, speed, up, speed ups during training which translates to dramatic cost reduction as well so ludwig supports all three of these different options here's how you would do it in the config so for instruction fine tuning um, we have a text input text output we say that we're doing a fine tuning trainer and we give the model name as, you know, in this case, Llama 7 billion, whatever your LLM model is. For training the encoder and training a, a specialized classification decoder, what you do is you actually change it to set the large language model as being the encoder for the text feature and then have this category output feature. And you make sure to set trainable equals true. And then if you want to freeze the encoder, it's very similar to what we had here, but with trainable equals false. Um, and in this case, we're no longer adjusting the parameters, uh, the weights of this model, we're only adjusting the weights here. So the thing I want to emphasize about those configs is that you should try to avoid modifying the LLM weights if you don't have to. 
And so this is a quick vis visualization showing you what the difference in runtime is when you, you know, set trainable equals true versus trainable equals false um, and different optimizations you can layer on top. So in the simplest case, you know, you could take a task that takes almost an hour to train um, and then by, you know, freezing the weights and then enabling a feature of Ludwig called cached embeddings, you can get all the way down to, you know, just seconds, tens of seconds, uh, maybe minutes in the worst case uh, to train um, by having, by basically skipping a lot of the expensive part of, of the process, which is back propagating the weights through the LLM or even running multiple forward passes over the model. So definitely, um, you know, one thing that Predibase offers is this ability to kind of very quickly swap between these different options and see which one works best for you. And in particular, being able to start with something cheap and then move your way to something more expensive only if you need it, right? Without having to make any code changes or anything like that. Um, if you do have to actually train the model, there are other features that Ludwig and Predibase support that can uh, help you with uh, on the cost savings front. So there's what's called parameter efficient fine tuning. Uh, Ludwig and Predibase support all these different options for what we call prompt modifications or prompt tuning, where you basically inject a trainable uh, set of parameters into the prompt of the model. Adapter methods, where you add new layers in the middle of the model. And then reparameterizations, where you basically take the weights from one layer and then kind of add in um, an additional component that adjusts those weights and you train that component only. Uh, LoRa or low rank adaptation is a really popular uh, solution for this. And in particular, in today's uh, demo, we're gonna be showing you a model that was trained using low rank adaptation, which is one of the most popular ones out there. Uh, basically, it works by just holding uh, pre-trained weights on the, on the left here, adding some additional, um, an additional matrix that outputs uh, trainable, param uh, trainable weights and then basically summing them together in, in a sense to get the final output. And so only this part gets trained and it ends up being a very cheap option to, um, to do this. And all of this is possible um, by just saying adapter equals LoRa in your config and um, that's all you need to do to, to enable it. And uh, suddenly you can get your trainable parameters down to something like less than a percent of the, the model parameters. Ludwig and Predibase also supports uh, data plus model parallelism to scale out to multiple nodes and multiple GPUs. Uh, Deep Speed, for example, is a really popular framework that allows you to do this. Um, so Ludwig provides native integration with Deep Speed, um, also different optimization levels. In Predibase, all of this is abstracted away from you and you don't even need to think about it, but those options are all there for people you know, running this on their own infrastructure with Ludwig. Um, to be able to um, enable these different optimization modes. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to um, Arnav to uh, tell us a little bit about instruction tuning. Uh, so hand it over to you, Arnav. Thanks, Travis. Uh, one moment, let me share my screen. Uh, are you guys able to see it? Yes. OK, awesome. So um, cool. So you know, as Travis discussed, instruction tuning can be pretty challenging and time consuming, especially when you have to deal with you know, implementing a training loop with complex code for fine tuning in PyTorch, you know, managing model parallel training across multiple devices, and um, also scaling your infrastructure to actually support training and inference. So, so for today's demo, I thought it'd be fun to demonstrate just how easy it is to perform instruction tuning using Predibase and Ludwig. Um, and we'll use fine tuning Llama 7 billion on the Alpaca data set as our example. Um, so just to set some context, uh, let me introduce Llama. Uh, it's essentially a collection of foundation large language models that Meta released to the research community in Feb this year. Um, and just like many other large language models, um, these models are trained to predict the next token in a sequence. Um, and so they come in, so La Meta released this in a variety of sizes from 7 billion parameters to like 13 billion, 30 billion, 65 billion. Um, and that's sort of like the top end in terms of parameters. And the reason, you know, I'm bringing this up is, and, and why this sort of took the research community by storm is that they were able to exceed or match the performance of very, very large uh, models that are, you know, eight to 10 times as big in terms of number of parameters. And that's pretty significant. 
Um, so the original Llama paper claims that Llama 13 billion outperforms GPT-3, which is like, you know, 175 billion parameters. And Llama 65 billion is competitive with, you know, Google's Palm 540 billion on a variety of benchmark tasks. Um, and coming back to this once again, the reason that this is important is that having models that are this small in size yet give you this kind of performance means that they are cheaper to train and use for inference, uh, both in terms of the time taken as well as the actual cost of the hardware or underlying GPUs that you need for training and inference. Um, and this actually makes it really easy and very affordable for a lot of you know, individuals and companies um, uh, to train and use these models and give them get, get similar performance. So we'll be using the smallest variant today for instruction tuning. Um, and, oh, um, and so shortly after Llama was released in Feb, um, Stanford released this model called the Alpaca model. Uh, which is essentially a Llama model that was fine-tuned on, or essentially instruction-tuned on a data set. So this data set has 52,000 instruction response pairs. Um, and and, the, reason, and like, the main question to ask is, what was missing from Llama 7 billion that made them want to instruction-tune the, uh, the model? And so instruction-tuning sort of helped the model perform tasks it wasn't trained on uh, and gives the model new capabilities to perform you know, a wide range of applications such as um, sentiment analysis, question answering, you know, rule-based tasks, even providing recommendations. Um, and if you guys are familiar with ChatGPT, this is actually very similar to what ChatGPT is able to do, where it is able to follow your questions or your instructions um, and provide a reasonable response. So just to give you a flavor of what this data set looks like, um, it consists of three columns, uh, instruction, input, and output. And broadly speaking, this data set of 52,000 rows has um, you know, two types of examples. So the first type is the example to your left where you have an instruction and an output. So an example here is create a new sport that combines elements of basketball and soccer. And the, an example output response is the new sport would be called soccer ball and it would involve a goal similar to soccer and a court similar to basketball. And then, you know, the rest of the response describes the rules of the of the, of the sport. Um, and, and there's another sort of, uh, a type of example in the data set where you have instruction input and output. And the reason this exists is because sometimes you have a task, but the task needs more context. Um, and so we provide it through this input um, sort of like column in the data set. Um, an example here is explain why the following fraction is, you know, equal to one by four. And then the fraction that we want to consider um, to explain this is four by 16. And so we have a corresponding output that says, you know, divide by four, they're, they're basically equivalent. And so, oops, um, one moment. Yeah, so uh, so this brings us to the actual task that we're gonna do today. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll quickly hop into Petabase in a moment, but to give you a high level idea of what we're gonna do, we'll walk through the process of fine tuning Llama 7 billion using the Alpaca data set. Once we fine tune our model, um, we'll sort of verify the results and see how it did compared to the original Llama 7 billion model that you know Meta released. Um, and one thing I wanted to call out before I dive in is that even though what we're doing today with this task is going from natural language input to natural language output, Redibase also makes it really easy to go from natural language input to structured output, such as JSON or YAML, and it follows pretty much the same fine tuning process. Um, so with that, let's hop into Redibase. So uh, when you first land into Redibase, uh, you're taken to the query editor. You guys are still able to see my screen, right? I think so. Cool. So when you first land into into Petabase, um, you're, you're taken to this query editor um, <laughs> where you can run two types of queries. Uh, the people tab on the left takes you to our extension of SQL, which one can use for predictive analytics. So you can train, evaluate, and explain any model that you want in, in, in Petabase using simple SQL-like queries. And then the LLM tab on the left um, you know, takes you to this LLM playground where you can query you know, a pretty wide variety of open source large language models. Right now we only have four, but it's really easy to add more and deploy them yourself as Travis had showed you earlier. Um, right. And so uh, in addition to this, you, know, you can control a variety of parameters such as temperature or you know, max new tokens, which are pretty important for controlling your generation process. Um, and we'll be adding even more parameters in the future. So to set some sort of baseline to understand, you know, how Llama 7 billion does, you know, to begin with, um, I thought it'd be fun to try maybe a set of tasks and see, see the response. 
Um, if you guys are Lakers fans, you know, uh, we lost last night, but let's see, you know, this is an example query that we can ask uh, Lama 7 billion. So if LeBron James wins his fifth championship, and essentially this task is like a completion style task where the model's just supposed to complete the sentence uh, from there. And so looking at the response to this question, it says, if LeBron James wins his fifth championship, uh, he'll be the greatest player of all time. I'm not saying he's the greatest player of all time, but if he wins his fifth championship, he will be, you know, pretty good response actually. Yeah, I, I actually think this is, I, I would agree with it as a, as a biased fan. Um, and so maybe we can do a slightly different task, which is sort of like an open Q and A task, um, such as what is the capital of Italy? So let's take a look at this response. Uh, and so here we see the model sort of, you know, it's got the answer right, but not quite right in the way that it's expressed it. So you have the capital city of uh, capital of Italy is Rome, which is correct. But um, yeah, it just decides that, you know, it should just keep repeating this. So sometimes models do that. Um, and it's definitely true in the case of Lama 7 billion. Maybe one more that would be fun. And um, just, as, just to set a baseline um, is a zero shot task, so like classify this review as positive, negative, or neutral. So we give it a review and we ask it for sentiment. Um, right. And this is actually a really good example of, of, of like instruct, uh, in, instructing the model to do something. And so here you see this is what it's produced negative, neutral, positive, negative, neutral, positive, and it kind of goes on and on and on. So clearly, you know, it's good at generating um, coherent English text but it's not very good at following instructions or answering questions or any of those kinds of tasks and so this is usually a good point to say okay well maybe we need to you know fine tune fine tune our data um but one more thing i wanted to say as travis had mentioned is that outside of running open queries on your llm um Peribase supports indexing your data um, so you can actually connect your data and then do in context learning where we insert rows from your data into your prompt to enrich the prompt and then you know pass that to your llm uh, you can perform batch inference on your data set and you can actually query multiple llms at once for a single uh, for a single query so you can compare uh this responses from a variety of llms all in one go cool so jumping back um let's say we want to train our fine tune this huggy llama llama 7 billion model um using the alpaca data set. So the way you normally do it in Peribase is that you'd go to the data tab on the left and you connect your data set. Um, in this case, I've already gone ahead and, and done that in advance. And you can see that it's automatically inferred schema. There's an input field, there's an output field, there's an instruction field. We can also preview the data. Um, and so essentially, you know, it's very similar to the examples I was showing you before where, um, you know, this is the input instruction, which is classified the following into animals, plants, and minerals, and your inputs are oak tree, copper, ore, and elephant. And then you might have more open questions like compare and contrast the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Vietnam War. War. Um, so the data set is scattered with this. We also have this really cool feature in Predibase where we generate data set profiles that show you statistics, unique values, missing values, and infer types for you. So you don't have to worry about figuring this out yourself. So now that we have a data set that's connected, the next step in the Predibase modeling journey is to actually go into something called a model repository. So a model repository is essentially a collection of model versions that um, you can, it's essentially a place where you can connect the data set, iterate on your model, track that version history, compare them um, to understand what it, what's changing over time and see lineage. Um, and so once you're inside your model repository, you would actually click, um, you know, new model version and so what that does is it takes you into our model builder form um, where you can choose to explore suggested models which we'll come back to at another time or build a custom model um, the next thing you do is you set up your connection you pick your data set which is the same one that i showed you earlier and you pick your target um, based on that, you Predibase and Ludwig offer three different model types. There's general neural networks um, for a variety of like, like multimodal tasks. There's gradient boosted trees, and then there's um, you know large language models. And with large language models, um, you can essentially either fine tune them or you can use them for zero or few shot prompting. And so here you can see we've already inferred data types. We know missing values, so on and so forth. So what we can do is click next, 
Um, and then this takes us to our sort of like parameter page. Uh, what you can see here is that um, we sort of infer the entire model pipeline end to end, going from your input feature to your output feature. In our case, we'll be going from an input feature, we'll pre-process it, we're going to pass it through the LLM, we'll decode the output, we'll do some post-processing, and then actually generate your output feature, right? So it's pretty cool. And the best part about Petabase is that you can actually configure any parameter that you want and let, leave it to us to, you know, um, figure out reasonable defaults for the rest. So if I go inside parameters, all that you need to do to get started with fine tuning is specify a model name, either an internal one that you already have or something from Hugging Face. You can control uh, data transformations through providing a prompt, uh, which you know uh, we support a variety of prompt types and, and retrieval types um, that modify your data. Uh, this is actually a really good idea for instruction tuning in particular, because it guides the model towards the right sort of output. And so it's usually good to use a, a template. And many times it's dependent on the type of model and the type of data set that you have. Uh, you can control pre-processing. You can control feature-specific things like pre-processing options or the encoder, and then trainer-related parameters. So in this case, if you're in an LLM world, you'll want to pick between none and fine-tune. Fine-tuning actually lets you fine-tune your model, and none lets you perform zero-shot or few-shot inference. Um, I was going to hit train, but then I realized that, yeah, you know, um, fine-tuning is a pretty time-intensive process. So I did train um, and I'll fine tune an LLM in advance. So for just for the sake of this webinar, we'll just dive right in to the fine-tune model. And the best place to start here, so this is a model version. Um, and you can have many such model versions in your model repo. Um, so you have a config. Um, which is essentially a Ludwig config that we pre-populate based on uh, the parameters that you set. Um, so here you can see, you know, we have LLM model type using the Hagi Lama 7 billion model. We define our input and output features and set some sort of max sequence length, which is the number of input and output tokens. We can define our prompt. Um, and in our case, what's going to happen is that every row is going to be transformed into, below is an instruction that describes the task, write a response that appropriately completes the request, um, the input row, and then the response. Uh, ahead of time, what I had already done is merge the input column with the instruction column, so it will all show up in one row. And then, you know, uh, one of the things that we're going to do differently from the original Alpaca paper is um, we're actually going to do parameter-efficient fine-tuning, like Travis was talking about, where we don't fine-tune all the weights of the model, but just fine-tune, like, 0.2% of the weights of, of your entire like Llama model. Um, and so, yeah, we'll use the LoRa adapter, but you could actually set any of the adapters that, that Travis mentioned or actually do full fine tuning of the weights if you'd like. And then finally, we can set a bunch of trainer parameters. A lot of these are taken from the original Alpaca paper with slight variants um, based on, on scalable training. Um, and the final thing I can show you is learning curves. So within Ludwig, uh, let me get rid of these. Yeah, so within Ludwig, we support a variety of like uh, metrics that we compute. There's loss, of course, but then there's character error rate, perplexity, um, and then token and sequence accuracy. Um, in the case of loss here, you can see that um, we kind of show you loss over time. And in my case, um, my models really overfit the data. So, you know, uh, training loss is decreasing while validation loss is staying constant or slightly increasing. Um, I initially thought this was problematic, but it turns out it's actually totally okay for fine tuning tasks because it's still learning to generalize pretty well. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but if you wanted to adjust this, you could you know, reduce law, uh, training rate or set other regularization parameters. Um, and so now that we have a fine tuned model, I think the fun thing that, like the thing that we want to do is actually compare the original responses to the responses from our fine tuned LLM. Um, Actually, just before that, once you have a model, you can actually do a couple of things with it. You can actually um, export the model. So you can export it as a Ludwig model that you can then host yourself on your own infra. You can export it to TorchScript, and you can also you know, export it to Triton format and then host it on a Triton server with NVIDIA. Um, and then you can also do a one-click deployment um, that basically gives you a hosted inf inference endpoint um, that you can then query programmatically. So <clears throat> I've already deployed my model. Um, and so we'll go back into sort of like the the model editor to make this a little fun. Let me let me do something. Um, 
let's let's clean let's just uh maybe compare both the models side by side so here we'll do the alpaca model that's fine-tuned uh, that we fine-tuned and here's the original model um, so we can start with um, maybe like the open q a question which is what is the capital of italy so we already saw um, what that looked like on the left it'll show up again um, and then i can also run it on the right so here we saw that the model sort of you know, generate a lot of stuff. But um, on this side, you can see the capital of Italy is Rome. And so our fine tuned model actually, you know, caught this right. Um, but this is not such a hard, you know, question. So maybe we can try something even more interesting. We can go back to our sentiment analysis question and see how both models do. Uh, so on this side, we already saw that this does um, actually this didn't even produce a response. Uh, pretty interesting, whereas on this side, I can I click on it? Okay, yeah. Uh, on this side, you can see the response is, is negative, which is correct because, you know, it, it's the Wi-Fi at the hotel was very slow as the review that was left. Let's actually turn this up a notch and let's ask slightly harder questions. Um, I have two more. So this is sort of like a factual instruction where I'm chat GPT style or code Excel, where I'm like, how do I make an HTTP request in JavaScript? Um, so here, um, maybe we'll just do this one by one since, um, so here, you know, it's sort of regurgitating its training data. Uh, I'm trying to make an HTTP request in JavaScript. I'm using the following code. You can tell that this was probably trained on Stack Overflow data based on the response, uh, but this is not the response we're looking for. It's not useful uh, versus um, in this case, uh, if we run it with our fine tuned model, what we'll see is that, um, yeah, this is the response. To make an HTTP request in JavaScript, you can use the XML HTTP request object, so on and so forth. And it actually gives you functional code that you can use. So very cool that just by fine tuning and kind of prompting in the direction of, of understanding instructions and how to respond to them, um, it's able to actually give us the response. The final one that I'll do um, is sort of like a creative instruction, pretty common again in the chat GPT world, but um, what we're going to do is write a poem about a horse galloping on the moon. I thought this would be pretty interesting to do. Um, so the base model says, again, it looks like it's regurgitating training data that it was trained on. So the poem should be at least 10 lines long. It should rhyme. And then it kind of just goes into a loop where it just keeps producing the same thing. But um, And also, let's see how the fine-tuned model does. Um, okay, so the horse gallops on the moon amidst the stars and the dew. The night sky is its home where, it's, where it runs wild and free and wild. So it's actually produced a poem that may not rhyme, but it looks pretty good to me. Um, and so all of this is to say that, you know, fine tuning actually does make a considerable difference. And it's really, really easy to do through Predibase and Ludwig. And all it involves is single line uh, config changes. Um, cool. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it back to Michael, um, who can take it from here. OK, uh, that was awesome. A lot of questions coming in. So uh, many of these have been answered in chat, but I'll just sort of uh, bring them up again so we can answer them for the broader audience. Um, so just jumping in, what would you say are the pros and cons of fine tuning versus embeddings and doc retrieval? Oh, you're on mute, Travis. Gets me every time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So going back to the um, the flow chart that I had in my slides earlier, um, the way I typically think about it is that. Uh, in context, learning the, the retrieval augmented, um, you know, prompt injection and things like that, uh, that tends to work really well if you have enough, con if the context that's needed to answer the question adequately will fit inside a single prompt. And if that's like basically all the information in the universe that the model needs to know to, to answer that question effectively. Um, and so then, you know, there's often a question of, you know, good strategies for chunking and, and embedding the um, the chunks of data and things like that. 
Um, so we definitely have tools in the platform for that, which we um, showed briefly with the indexing selector and the, and the dropdown. Um, but oftentimes, if, for example, what you're trying to do is a generative task, like I want to generate a JSON file in a very specific schema that's very bespoke to my internal data or something like that, right? Like if you're trying to automate the outputs of the LLM um, in, a, in a, a workflow or something like that, then oftentimes I would say that um, just doing embedding retrieval uh, and insertion into the prompt is uh, probably going to one, not give you enough like context to like adequately answer like the full scope of, of questions. And also, I think there's still the probably the possibility of um, the output, you know, potentially not like the model never having really been trained to output the format that you're requesting it to specifically. And so it could still make errors or hallucinate, whereas if you fine tune it, you reduce the likelihood of some of those things from happening. Um, so, for example, I think the llama versus alpaca one is a really good example. There is, you know, you can try to prompt engineer your way into getting the base llama model to do an instruction through like clever prompting and things like that. But as you can see, it's very difficult to get to output, you know, exactly what you want. Whereas if you fine tune it to output in exactly the format that um, you're interested in, like in the case of instruction tuning, like an instruction and a response, you're much more likely to get um, a good result. Great. And there was a question actually specific to the platform, which was, uh, you know, is it necessary to, to use Protobase's APIs or do I have access to the train weights, the models, such that we can use them in our own our own system? And then where's the data stored? Yeah, so I think Arnav already showed how you can export any model. Um, so it's exported as a, you can export as a Ludwig model, um, which is at the end of the day, like going to be a zip archive containing um, PyTorch model weights, the config file, some checkpoints as well. Um, so you can basically take that and run it in your own infrastructure and like continue training from where it left off and, you know, basically manage the whole process yourself, extend Ludwig, you know, make changes, things like that. So it's all open and fully controllable. Um, in terms of the data component, so we have a few different ways of, of running Predibase. There's a, a VPC style deployment that runs in your compute cloud and there's a managed SaaS version that runs in our compute cloud. Um, depending on which option you choose, you have uh, different options of where the data is coming from. So for example, um, in VPC, um, you know, you might want to upload a file to an internal bucket or something like that. If you upload a file in the SAS version, it's managed in our, uh, our, our storage account, right? But you can also connect any external data source through credentials, like, you know, giving credentials to a private S3 bucket or a Snowflake database or something like that, in which case the data will always live um, as it's like source of truth in your account and uh, will only be pulled into uh, our environment for training. And then it's, you know, completely deleted after that. Right. But again, if you're running in VPC, the data never leaves your environment, even for training, it's for training. Uh, staying in your, in your account. Great. And someone was asking, you know, can you access a tuned LLM via an API? And, and absolutely, you can deploy to an, an API and ping it from an application. Yeah. Uh, so when it asked about a, a, a use case where a uh, generative AI use case that also incorporated, you know, audio and translating um, essentially like patient utterances into some sort of translated um, text, is that something that Ludwig and Protobase can support? Yeah, so we do support um, audio inputs to Ludwig today. Um, and then we're working on extending our LLM integration to support um, audio inputs and image inputs. Um, so there's some very promising literature out there that shows um, how to do this in a way that kind of maps to the Ludwig structure very nicely. And so that's for 0 0.8, you know, we focus primarily on the fine tuning piece. And then for 0 0.9, which will be our release in June, we're going to be focusing on the multimodality piece and then the reinforcement learning piece. So those will be things coming in the next month to, to Ludwig. Great. And someone had a question about un unlabeled data and said, uh, does the kind of unlabeled data used affect the ability to fine tune the model? If yes, is it worth considering training the underlying sentence completion instead of trying to fine tune cost wise? Yeah. So to me, this question of like whether you want to do uh, more pre-training um, and use and train sentence completion first, mm -hmm. 
really comes back to how closely your data matches the data distribution that the model was originally trained on. So if, you know, in most cases, these models were trained on predominantly English language text, um, that's, you know, kind of what you would find on the public internet. If your data is, you know, very in domain, like only for specific, you know, like use a lot of jargon, maybe it's not in English, maybe it follows a weird syntax, then those are all cases where it might make sense to pre-train um, from scratch. So for example, Bloomberg published their Bloomberg GPT paper where they did in fact pre-train the model from scratch um, because they felt that their data was just so out of distribution from what all the open source LLMs were trained on. The, the flip side though, is that it costs them millions of dollars to do it, right? So that's you know why you would generally want to not do that as your first option if you can avoid it. Um, but there are reasons to do it in some cases. Yeah. Great, couple more questions here. <clears throat> um, how can you be certain that your generative AI you know, responses are correct? And then sort of a, a follow on is, does Protobase provide a confidence index available to queries? Yeah, well? that's a great question. So one thing that I really like about using open source LLMs as opposed to um, closed source LLMs is that, you know, we have access to the underlying uh, probabilities of every token that the model predicts. And so what that means is that one, we're able to present that to you uh, as a user if you're interested in knowing like how confident the model was in its result at an actual quantitative level. But it also means that we can manipulate that information to force the model to only output certain things that we want it to. So for example, if you wanna say, I don't want the model to ever say these words or phrases, or I wanna make sure that the model always says exactly one of these things in its output, or and only this thing in its output. So for example, if you're trying to predict sentiment and you wanna make sure that the model will only ever say like the words positive, negative, or neutral exactly once, um, we can do that and we can enforce that through the output features of the Ludwig schema that we showed you. Whereas for closed source APIs, they very rarely, I don't think any of them offer like that level of control to the user. Um, so it's definitely a big advantage of, of building on top of open technology. Yeah. Great, a couple more minutes here. So let's ask a few more. Can we use slash train only the encoder side with the decoder coming from our own private database? Um, yes, so you can uh, pop uh, swap in like different components um, as you like. So for example, if you have your own encoder um, that can be stored in uh, object storage or in, um, uh, or in the Hugging Face Hub or in Predibase itself, you can take that pre-trained model, use it the encoder, and then only only tune a decoder on top of it. Um, conversely, if you did have like your own custom decoder you wanted to use, you know you can do that as well. It's all very pluggable, so you know these different components can be swapped out um, as as you need to. Awesome. So I know we're um, at the end of the session here. We had a few questions we didn't get to. We'll definitely follow up. Um, individually with the folks. Um, thank you again for everyone who attended and thank you to our presenters and, and the great demo. Reminder, if you'd like to you know, take a spin of the Predobase platform and start you know, experimenting with LLMs and fine tuning them, you can submit the, you know, there's a link there and you can submit a request. Uh, you can also check out Ludwig.ai, a lot of uh, new capabilities that uh, are available for large language models and more coming as Travis shared at you know, www.ludwig.ai. The recording from today's session will be shared afterwards. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and we'll be happy to help you out. And, and thanks again for attending.